It strikes me with a lot of young people, and I think this is enormously to their credit and goes to the heart, I think, of what you're saying. They're told that all morality is relative. They don't live that way. Huh? They're actually no. looking for truth, aren't they? Well, if you live that way, everyone hates you. You know, but that's if, the creed that. Oh we're, yes, yes. But that's a good example of how you, who you are, can be out of sync of, with how you represent yourself. It's like, I was walking through the, with I was walking through these ideas with the audience last night. It's like, well, how do we treat each other when things work? You know, and how do you treat yourself? Well, first of all, you have to treat yourself like you matter, because if you don't, then you don't take care of yourself, and you become vengeful and 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 cruel. And you, you, take, you take it out on people around you, and you're not a positive force. None of that's good. So you suffer more, and so does everyone around you. And there's a malevolence that enters into it. None of that's good. So that's what happens if you don't treat yourself like you matter. And then well, what happens if you don't treat other people like they matter? Well, you lie to them, you cheat them, you steal, you, you, you enter into impulsive relationships with them. They can't trust you. That doesn't go anywhere. They don't like you. You you end up alone at best, and maybe like in, in, incarcerated at worst. Like that doesn't work. And so, you watch the people around you who thrive, regardless of what they say. They act out the proposition that everyone matters, and then you have a functional society. And I think, okay, well, if 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 when you act out the proposition that everyone matters, you have a functional society, maybe that's evidence that that proposition is true. It's like, I think it's, I think it's true. I think the idea that the individual has a spark of divinity within him or her, I think there isn't a more true way of saying that. And if you act that out, well, this is, goes back to the idea that you brought up about potential, which is also something I've discussed with my audiences a lot. It's like, we don't act like we live in a material reality. We act like we face a landscape of potential, an external landscape of potential with an internal reservoir of potential. That's how we act. And then we call each other out on it. We say things like, well, you're not living up to your potential. And the person goes, so yeah, well, I know. It's like, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Well, you mean there's more to you than meets the eye. Even though it's not measurable, right? It's yeah. not tangible. It's just possibility. But everyone acts as, that, as though that's a reality. Mm. And we all, act as if, we all act as if we make choices about what reality to bring into being. We, 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 we punish ourselves for our moral errors and, and other people as well. We act out this, this ethic that puts us each at the center of being as active participants in the world that we want to bring forward. Everyone acts that way. And if we don't, then things go to hell instantly. So it's like, well, what do we believe? This is the argument I've had with people like Sam Harris, the atheist types. It's like, yeah, you think you're atheist, man. It's like, you're Christian, Judeo-Christian, let's say, to the core. You just don't understand it. You just don't realize it. And it's understandable, but it's not helpful. This idea that you put forward of a spark of divinity in every human being yeah. surely lies at the heart of the miracle of Western freedom. The idea yeah. that every individual has worth and dignity mm -hmm. and standing. It's the idea that killed slavery. Right? Slavery is the everywhere. The greatest human rights movement of all times, so successful that it obliterated the idea that it was all right to keep slaves, yeah. let alone change the law. It changed the way the world thought, even though there are yeah. evil, pe evil people who still keep slaves. And, and here's a rub. It was plainly led by people of profound Christian faith. Mm -hmm. There's no other way of putting well, it. No, Anyone who right. honestly, honestly, and, and that's truthfully looks at the history of that period, can't get away from it. Yep. But because it doesn't suit the modern left's narrative, it's airbrushed out. Hmm. Doesn't that in itself say something profound hmm. about our willingness to try and distort truth it, it's to hard, suit our objectives? It's hard to say what, 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 it, what it speaks of. You know, it's, 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 hard. it's like the, the whitewashing of what happened in the, in the, in the Soviet states, you know, in the communist states in the 20th century. I mean, hmm. anybody who goes through that literature with any degree of care, comes away traumatized, right? Shell-shocked. Mm. It's just, it's, it's, it's everything the Nazis did on a larger scale. It's horrifying, and yet I see with my students, 50 example, or 60 million people who dared to disagree died? Mm. Oh, well, at minimum, it was- In it their was, own culture? Mm -hmm, it was something- In their own society? We don't know, in, in the Soviet Union, the estimates range from 20 to 60 million. And mm. in Maoist China, the estimates are, as much as 100 million. Are our right, kids so taught this in school? No, not at all. In universities? Why not? Very. I think you see, their societies, let's preface yep. something. 
The modern fight, in, in, it seems to me, in many ways, is between what might be called freedom and fairdom, uh, fairness yep. and equality. Mm -hmm. Equality sounds terrific. Yep. But we've actually seen what happens in societies well, where they set equality up yeah. as the ultimate goal. They became yeah. terrible places. Yeah. Well, How did is, that happen? Well, I think this is it part of the problem. It sounds good. Yeah, well, that's, I think that's also part of the, the whitewashing is we can't understand how one of our primary moral intuitions, which might be fairness, let's say, can transform itself into something so utterly murderous when it's played out on a large political stage. And I think because we don't understand that, I mean, look, there's reasons to be on the left. There are temperamental reasons first. So a lot of your political preference is influenced, let's say, by your temperament. And a lot of your temperament is influenced by biological factors. So there are temperamental reasons to be on the left. People who are on the left tend to be higher in creativity and lower in conscientiousness, for, for example. Those are the two best predictors. But there's also practical reasons to be on the left. And one of the practical reasons are that human societies, which tend to be hierarchical, like all animal societies or almost all animal societies, produce inequality as they go about their business. And inequality is actually quite painful. No one likes it. Nobody, no rich capitalist walks down a busy urban street and sees a starving homeless person who's clearly mentally ill, suffering madly, and thinks that, in that inequality is okay. No one thinks that. No one's for poverty, right? And so we have this moral intuition that it would be better if the downtrodden were lifted up. And it's difficult to discriminate between that and an inequality narrative. And so I think part of the reason that we can't face the, the, the lesson of the 20th century is because it's the left that mostly has to face the lesson and they don't know how to reconcile their deep intuitions about the injustice of inequality with the fact that when you put that doctrine in, at work into, into operation as a political tool, you instantly stack up millions of corpses. We don't know what to do with that. And so we just avoid it. And that's, well, and then of course we risk replicating it, which is not a good, that's not a good uh, tactical move. Well, that's say. the problem. If we don't learn from history, we're destined to repeat mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I entirely accept, and some Australians might be surprised by this, they say, no, I can't understand a leftist perspective. I think I can. I can understand the nobility of wanting to ensure that everyone is respected as a full member of the, of the human family, of our culture and our society. But this is where it gets so tricky, and it's where I think many young people are starting to wake up. They're being sold a pup. Mm -hmm. Do you have that expression in mm -hmm. Canada? No, no. Sold a pup? No. Sold a dud. Mm -hmm. you know? I see, yeah. It's not a sound idea. Right. That many of the things that sound attractive don't necessarily work. So perhaps we need to be arguing the case for freedom and fairness, which will produce at least a high degree of equality of opportunity, mm -hmm rather than arguing for equality, which history tells us tends to severely erode freedom. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's, it's a harder sale, though, because you but know, it's, it's, it's easy to appeal to compassion immediately, thoughtlessly, yeah. right? And, yeah. and since that's such an instantaneously positive moral virtue, and you don't need sophisticated argumentation to mm. buttress it, it's a lot more difficult mm. to make a cold, analytical case that the, the proposition freedom first, let's say, freedom mm. and responsibility first, lifts mm. the bottom up better. Yeah. It's a cold argument and mm. it requires rationality to parse through, so it's a harder sale. I would argue though, it's not just rationality, it's history. Mm. If you yes. bring rationality and honesty to the study of history, I think, I think the, 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 the case is actually quite compelling. I, I think it is too. In fact, I think it's open and shut. I, I think it's, it's, well, there's a book that I've just been reading that I would recommend um, by a man named Walter Scheidel. And he wrote a book called uh, The Great Leveler, which I really like. It's an empirical analysis of inequality. And he had, his research questions were something like, um, well, what, what is the phenomena of inequality? To what can you attribute it? And what, if anything, can we do to ameliorate it? Okay, so the first answer is something akin to what I wrote in the first rule in my book, 12 Rules for Life, which is, well, you can't lay hierarchy and inequality at the feet of Western civilization or capitalism. We're done with that argument. That's wrong. Animal societies are hierarchical and they produce unequal distributions. And you, there's evidence for that in the biological realm going back a third of a billion years. And that's happened for so long that your nervous system has primarily adapted to it. 
So it's a deep reality and blaming it on capitalism. It's like, no, 